Hey, Dennis, how are you? Claudio, nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. So, so glad to have you here. And thank you for doing this again. So today we're going to talk about Rock and Roll Over, which is the next album after Destroyer. But before we move forward with that, I, um, I forgot to ask you one important question on the first okay. one, the first chapter. Okay which is when you were called, um, let's go back a little bit when you first talked to Bill O'Coin about doing this photo shoot for Kiss for the first album. What did you think about the idea of the makeup and this new band? Because now they're like household names and they're iconic, but back then it was a new concept. It was something unheard of. So what did you think? What was your first impression? Yeah, uh, well, that's not the first time I saw them. Mm -hmm. So I knew what to expect when I went into the photo studio when we were going to shoot the first album. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time I saw them was at this, uh, uh, you probably know if you know your history, uh, yeah. they did a little rehearsal uh, thing at a place called Le Tang Dance Studio, Le Tang. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was probably early 74 uh, or, or so. Did you, go, did you go with Bill? Did he yeah, take I went. Oh, okay. well, he, he told me where it was. He said, we're going to do a little uh, three songs. You'll get to see what, this, what they look like and what they sound like. And um, so Bill was there. I was there. The only, the only people I remember being there, there were about 10 people there, 10 or 12. It was me, Bill O'Coin, uh, Neil Bogart. Sean Delaney. Sean may have been there, but I don't remember him being there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the only other person I remember being there, because I sat next to her, was uh, uh, Ace's uh, girlfriend, uh, whose name is Jeanette. Jeanette. Jeanette, yeah. She sat next to me. And, uh, and that was the first time I saw them. And that was, uh, I was, uh, I don't know what the word is. I was uh, not shocked, but kind of uh, taken back. I said, what? the hell am I looking at? You know, so different. Right. And of course, they were right in front of me. I mean, I could literally reach out if I leaned forward and touched them. It was just a little room that we were in. And they were all close together, but they had some big amps, you know, for the small room. And so it was loud. They gave us ear earplugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're sitting on little folding chairs, watching these guys. They did three songs. And I said, well, wow, they were a little scary, too, because Gene's like in your face. Right. Being a monster and leering at you and looking at you. And I'm going, you know, uh, what is this? I don't know. You know, uh, was that the was that the first time you talked to them after the rehearsal? The fir uh, first time I talked to them. Mm. Well, first of all, I don't think I talked to them that day. <laughs> OK, they were there. They did their show and that was it. Right. Uh, I saw them also at the Fillmore East doing a rehearsal, mm -hmm. in an empty, empty, big theater. Um, that day, Bill said, uh, they're going to rehearse down at the Fillmore. Uh, he gave me a KISS logo, which was cut out of plastic with Ryan's sparkly stuff on it, you know? He said, can you uh, glue this on the drum head? Can you come down and glue it on the, dr the bass drum head? I said, sure, showbiz, you know. So I went down. It was cold that day. Uh, must have been in the, you know, winter. I think it was January. And uh, I went up in the balcony and I got, the, somebody gave me the drug head and I mixed up some five minute epoxy. I stuck it on, somebody took it, they put it on the drum and then the next day I know they were playing and uh, there it was on the drum head. And I think they kept it on the drum for quite a while. I think there's a few videos of that of that logo on the drum kit. Plenty of, yeah, there's plenty of photos of it. And now that you mentioned the logo, what did you think of the logo, which was designed by Ace? As yeah, what? designed by Ace and fixed up by Paul. By Paul. Yeah, yeah. What, what was so your He didn't fix it up that great, because he didn't have the proper tools. It was still raggedy. It was still kind of funky, you know? So they gave it to me. Oh, it's they said, uh, can you make this more professional? Ah. Clean it up. I said, sure. I'll, I'll read it. 
Do you remember what was that for? Was that for an album cover or was for advertising? It was for anything. It was for general use. Right. We just better have a better logo. So basically, or, let, let's state this. You did the perfected version that became, you know, the final revision right. of the logo. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's oh. right. That's, that's not a small thing. You know? <laughs> but, I said, but I said to Paul, Paul was uh, in the art department for some reason. And I said, look, uh, you realize both those S's are not the same as each other. Right. So they're a little funny. You want me to make them the same? Yeah. The one on the edge has a less angle than the one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So they did it by hand, and then he just tried to fix it. But they didn't use T-square triangle. They didn't make it square, you know. Mm -hmm. He said, no, it's, uh, it's worked for us like this so far. Just leave it. I said, okay, I'll just make everything nice and sharp and crisp. And that was it. Hmm. Wow, very interesting. From the, from the designer's point of view, that's, uh, uh, you know, know historically, it's a, it's a dream job. Because yeah, by the way, since we're talking about the very early, 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 early days, mm -hmm. I was thinking about this not too long ago. I believe that I really am the only person left. By left, I mean alive, that was there from day one. Well, except for the group. Except for the group, yeah. <laughs> Bill is dead. John Delaney is dead. Uh, I'm assuming. I'm assuming also Lydia, Chris was there. I'll, yeah, but Lydia doesn't count. Oh, you mean for decision making? Yeah, part of the. Uh, yeah, part part of the creative uh, group and people who are in like that. I mean, she was married to the drummer. I mean, you know, you could say Jeanette too, but. Uh, and then don't forget, Lydia wasn't there. Got it. Point after it. after Peter left, they, the band continued, mm -hmm. and I was still there. Mm -hmm. So there's right. nobody alive. Sorry. Not, there's nobody alive. Right. Yeah. That's uh, crazy. I can't think of anybody. So, J.R. Smalling, he died. He wasn't. He wasn't the first guy anyway. So let's move. Chuck was the first road manager. With uh, with rock and roll over. So um. Talk to me about the, the, the initial concept for the cover. How, uh, who, what came first, the title for, for this, as always? You gave me a title in this case, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm now, wearing the appropriate shirt, notice. Oh, wow. <laughs> for our interview, there it is. How did you find uh, Michael Doré for this? Did you find him, like you found, like you found uh, Ken? Yes, I found him. I, I didn't find him. I knew about Michael mm -hmm. beforehand. Uh, as an art director, I'm kind of aware of the talent that's out there, especially people who impress me, people who I love personally. Mm -hmm. Also, art directors, many art directors, have uh, a, a sort of little index in their head of the great people that are out there, illustrators or photographers, painters, right. designers even. And they secretly hope that someday they will have a project that has a budget that will allow them to hire some of these great people. Right. Because they want to work with them. Mm -hmm. And they want to produce this work. And you say, I, I was the art director. I hired this wonderful artist. And boom, we produced this great thing. And um, so I was like that too. And I knew about Michael. Always wanted to use him on something. How old was he when, in 1977? How what? How old? Was he in 1970? Old? Yeah. He's eight. I don't know. Mid-20s? Uh, well, Michael might have been, I don't know. I, you know, I, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, he could have been 30. Let me see. He could have been late 20s. He could have been early 30s. But that's, it's around that neighborhood. I, I also Michael's probably close to a, in age as me, you know. While I was, doing, while I was doing a little research yesterday uh, for, for Michael Doré, I found a, an interesting uh, second or third degree connection between him and me. Yeah. Apparently, he was working under the wing of uh, Doug Johnson at that point. Do you know Doug? Yes, I do. Doug did two, three album covers for Judas Priest. For who? Judas Priest, oh. He did those iconic album covers of the 80s that are kind of art deco, right? It is Scream ah, for Vengeance. Yeah, that was the style. Yeah. I never met Doug. I don't think I ever met him. 
Well, he did Cream for Vengeance, the one with the eagle, that yellow one. Then he did Defenders of the Faith, the big cat, like that it's also a tank. And then Torbo, which is kind of a, a female hand holding a joystick. So, yeah. and apparently in 1977, uh, Michael was working either for Doc or kind of under his wing as a designer. I'm not sure which, you know, so that's... A yeah, that could be, yeah. I mean, uh, Michael also shared office space. Oh, crap, I'm sorry I just brought this up because now I'm not going to remember the guy's name. But another very cool uh, designer, illustrator. Uh, maybe it'll come to me before the end of the interview, but because mm -hmm. I went down to Michael's office and he was sharing space with this other fellow who was really good too, really cool. Totally different uh, style, but uh, cool. So what do you recollect about the process of talking to, to Michael, explain? Well, first of all, uh, Rock and Roll Over is the name of the next album, Dennis. Uh, go design it. So uh, I wanted to do something very different than Destroyer. Mm -hmm. Sure, is a painting, fantasy art, oil paint, lush brush strokes, and you know it's a painting, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's you know it's very sort of romantic in a lot of ways. You know, it's like yeah. like, like your work in in many ways. Old school. You know, it's got that feeling about it, and uh, I wanted to do something completely different. What would be completely different? Flat, bright colors, hard edge. That's what I wanted to do. And Michael Durrett, that's what he does. He so does it was that. Your, the, the style was your idea? Yeah, well, yeah, well uh, the style and the artist together. Got it. I wanted to use Michael. I wanted to use him, like I said before. Got it. He's a great talent. I always wanted to use him for something. And I said, here's my opportunity. And the, his style is going to be so different than uh, the previous album, Destroyer. That's, that's what I want to do. So, uh, you know, I contacted Michael. Uh, I showed his work, I guess, to Howard Marks, and I don't know if, if I showed it to anybody in the band. If it was anybody in the band, it would have been Paul. He was really the only one who was involved in these decisions about album covers. He also Bean, I, not so much, and the other two guys never. I think he also has some some kind of background in artwork. I never talked. Yeah, about that. yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, so. Uh, I, uh, they, they were very lukewarm about me choosing Michael. Mm. I don't know, you know, I don't know. You know. I said, it's going to be great. Let me, you know, so they let me go ahead. And uh, I, I got Michael. I showed him all the pictures of the band. I, you know, I tried to describe everything, uh, everything we had done up to that point. And he, uh, Michael says he doesn't rem remember this. But he, when he came around on my first meeting, because I talked to him on the phone first, then he, when he came around for the first meeting face to face with me, uh, he had something in a book or a, uh, or a copy of a page of a book. And it was a upside down, right side up picture. You know, they, they were sort of a novelty pictures. You've seen them yourself. It'll be a man with a beard. You know, and then you turn it upside down, and the, now the beard is hair on somebody's head, and the lips, and you know, it's a right side up, upside down picture. Mm -hmm. So it was called Rock and Roll Over, and he was thinking of trying to do something like that. And I said, uh, no, <laughs> uh, basically because it won't appeal to their egos, because mm -hmm. it'll be everybody all in one. I said, there was a little bit of that in Hotter Than Hell, which I didn't do. But you know how Hotter Than Hell has half a jeans eye and you know it's sort of this and that and a and face it, that's broken up and like that. I said, so eh, it's a little bit too close to that. And I said, I'm sure they all want to see their individual face. That's, that's a given. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. And that was it. So we just talked about a circular design. Rock and roll over. Let's make a circular design. And in a way, it is an upside down, right side up. It's funny. You can turn it around and look at it from four different yeah, ways. Still, it's funny they say that, but if, if you look at the cover, the right way to put it, which is with the opening. Oh, believe me, I thought about that. They're still on top. No kidding. Who do you, who do you think made that decision? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, right off the bat, I said, the slot goes over here. 
and it's Gene and Paul on top. No question. <laughs> All these little decisions. And it's good you noticed. So uh, Michael did uh, – right. there is a sketch. You're aware of that, right? Yes, I saw it. Paul and Gene's faces are slightly different. Gene, That's right. Gene is like smiling, and Paul's hair looks like an afro. Yeah, and it's a little smaller, and he had to make it, and the curls are a little nicer, I and the no boots, and you know, the nose and things like I that. I can totally see why he didn't like that. <laughs> right. It wasn't uh, flattering. Flattering, yes, that's the word. Yeah, you know, and, and, if, and you know, Paul is a bit of a narcissist, uh, a bit. Yeah. So, uh, um, but, but the rest of it was pretty much dead on. Michael did it in colored pencil, it was nice and tight you know, for a sketch, but that's Michael. Michael is, um, you know, he's a professional. Okay. And you know how we were talking the other day about being, being like a, um, Knowledgeable a, a craftsman and, and, and just you do the job and Michael is like that. Mm -hmm. Obviously he has his ideas and his creative input and all of that stuff, but he is, he is a professional very, very uh, uh, technically uh, advanced. And uh, so he did a great sketch. And uh, Paul saw the sketch, he changed it. Uh, he said, make my, make my nose better, make my hair this way, that way. And Michael nailed it. He only had to do it once. He didn't have to go back and forth. He understood what Paul was saying. Mm -hmm. Maybe Paul drew a little bit, you know, to make him understand it. Mm -hmm. He went back, he did it, boom, boom, boom. So, however, I know that the gist of these interviews is the technical aspect uh, of how the, a lot of these things were done. Yeah, and I right. did a little research on that too. It was done in film, right? Just for the... That's right. And uh, my description and explanation that's going to come up now <laughs> is, um, is uh, tedious if, if, if uh, you don't know what I'm talking about. And... Um, it's called and boring and boring if you don't care, you know. Well, it's uh, in basic words, you can expand it later, but it was uh, black ink on film, right? And on acetate, yes. Mm -hmm. Each layer was a different color. That exactly. would be okay. that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So most artwork is done in color if it's going to be produced in color. Mm -hmm. It's done in color, like the painting or whatever. That is then photographed. Then it's given to the separator, what we call the separator. Yeah. We have to photo mechanically separate the colors onto Mechanic. four pieces of film. Mm -hmm. And so uh, offset lithography printing is done usually on a four color press. The four colors are magenta, which is a kind of a really hot pink red. Mm -hmm. Cyan, which is a very acid looking bright blue. Mm -hmm yellow and black offset those four yeah. colors in different proportions and different pot, dot patterns overlapping make every color so a little bit of yellow dot and 50 percent of red dot and as they go through the press and out it comes and you have orange and you can make any color by percentage of dots and how they break it up photo mechanically this there's, was only, done, this there's only four inks right this was done in flat colors Right? It's flat. This is flat. Now, so I, I asked, I, I, it, it, I know his style is flat color, and I, and I want it to be bright, vivid, flat, perfect, like that. If, you, if, he, if he produced that, let's say, in zip tone colors, or, you know, the, the, uh, if he, whatever method, let's say he produced that art in color, and then we photographed it like regular and photo mechanically separated it. It's going to be dots. It's going to be dots. Um, and uh, you could, you know, uh, and I didn't want that. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be flat color. And how do you get that? Well, you have to produce, you have to produce the art a different way. So I said, Michael, can you pre-separate this and do it? And, and, and he, he said, oh, no. <laughs> Did he, uh, did he you think about it? It's so much more work. Was he was he aware of that process or did Oh you may Michael knows what he's doing. Yeah. He's okay. back then we we were 
you know, we knew the craft. We knew the, how printing is done. Right. You had to know more than design and art. I mean, if you were good, you had to know what happens after you produce the art, what the printer has to do then, and then what the result is going to be. And could you have produced it differently to get a better result? I mean, you have to know that. Also, another question before you go on. How much bigger was were this uh, film? wasn't any bigger. It was uh, just about 12 by 12, as I recall. Oh, really? Wow. Well, it didn't have to be. It didn't have to be bigger. Mm -hmm. It was okay. done with rapidograph, pens, technical pens, beautiful, perfect, crisp. I mean, you know, it was done like if you had it on a computer, it couldn't have been any better. Got it. Wow. Okay. And, he, he, and Michael has skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I've seen some of his uh, some of his sketches and they're really good. Yeah, he's he's got a lot of skill, knowledge. So then Michael took it a step further since he was going to do it that way, and he said, uh, "I'm gonna, how about six colors instead of four?" Mm -hmm. I said, "Well, you know, that means we have to go on a six color press. That there, there are not too many of those around, for one thing." Everything is done in four color process. Yeah. But I, I said, yes, we found that, you know, yes, that could be done. Uh, our printer had a six color press is a, a, a hell, uh, a, a German press, H-E-L-L. -L. Wow. That Heidelberg was the big, the big press, but the, the, the uh, hell, I think it was a hell press. Six colors, so it said six stations. But you know, back then these presses were, uh, they were modular. Mm -hmm. So they could add stations to the press. So theoretically, you could have a 10 color press, I guess, just go through and keep adding and adding and adding. They just hook them up, each station. So six color press. So what he did was he, he, he designated some of the layers on acetate. So there were two blues. Yeah, I noticed that there's a- Probably- dark, There is a dark blue in this, the- This right? blue here, and then that lighter blue here are two different colors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not a tint of that. This is a whole separate color. This blue, wait, this blue here, and then the other blue for the lower- Absolutely, blue. two different colors. Mm -hmm. Two different inks, and two different stations on the press. Now, if that was four color process, that lighter blue would have just been a tint of the darker blue. But maybe with some red in it, I mean, it could have been different. But flat, flat, flat. So, uh, and he wrote notes to the engraver. Engraver, note, blah, 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 blah. If you could see wow. the acetates. Yeah, Michael. I said, cool, Michael. Now, what we did was something that very few people would do. But we made uh, press proofs of that album cover, meaning... Usually the first time you would see it printed would be when it's getting printed. We went with our pre-separated art from Michael, gave it to the printer and said, we want to see press proofs, ink on the real substrate, what it's going to be printed on. And we want to see it before it gets printed thousands and thousands of copies. Wow. So we're going to print it before it's printed to make sure that it's coming out right. So you can imagine the expense of that. I mean, putting it on a press and everything. But we did it, we got these beautiful press proofs. Ah, oh, I mean, mwah, you know, like that. And uh, they were gorgeous. And uh, I said, this is it. We got a winner. So very often, uh, I, the, we used a place called Shorewood Printing. They were way out on Long Island, Farmingdale, Long Island, way out. And, uh, and uh, they would send me to, watch it get printed and make sure it was getting printed okay. Because if it wasn't, I would say, stop the presses. This is no good, you know. Uh, or they would just give it to me and if it was good, I would have to initial one of the, one of the things coming off the press. They would say, he okayed it, okay. And then they'd send me home and they'd finish the job. Now, for some reason, the, this company, you know, it's a big, they printed, everybody's albums back in the day. Shorewood invented, uh, before Shorewood, there was the name of a guy, Shorewood. Uh, he invented something called a Shore Pack. And what, it, what they did was they printed right on the cardboard. And then that went to another process where it got cut out with the flaps and then scored and then folded and glued and it became an album cover. 
Before that, they printed the album cover on paper. Look at old albums in your, in your record store. Printed it on paper. The paper was then glued onto the cardboard. To the cardboard, yeah. And then yeah. they made that into an album. Yeah. So he eliminated that whole step. I think, up until, I think up, up until the early 70s, a lot of those were yeah. being made. So he eliminated that step and they printed it right on the board. The board was a little bit lighter so that it could go through the press, but it was okay. So for some reason, when they were printing our jobs, our kiss jobs, they were always being printed. These companies ran all night, 24 hours a day. They never stopped. The, uh, they had three shifts of people. Um, the, uh, the, uh, they printed everybody's album. And it was just constant. They never, the presses never stopped. They would stop. They'd take off somebody's job. They would clean the plates, take off the plates, clean the, the rubber mats, put, hang new plates, get it going. And I mean, it just went and went and it went. They didn't stop. For some reason, the kids' jobs were always printed at two or three in the morning. The graveyard shift. So they called Dennis to say, your job is scheduled to go on press at 2 a.m. <laughs> and they send the car for me. I get in the car, I live in Manhattan. They send the car for me, we go all the way out to Farmingdale and uh, get into the place and they bring me out to the press room. And the thing is usually running or starting to run. You know. And so they're running this uh, rock and roll over, and it's not right. Oh. <laughs> After all that trouble we went through with the press proof, what, to make what, sure that it would be right. Why was it that, was, that it was wrong? There, there was something about this, this lighter blue. Hulk, you got the album there? Yeah, right here. Yeah, so I think it was the lighter blue. It was just, it had a funny, yeah, and in and parts of the uh, art, it had a funny quality to it. It was doing something odd. It, it wasn't flat and beautiful and pure. It had a funny little model quality to it. And I said, well, what's that, you know? And the guy with the suit comes out, you know, the guy wearing a tie, not the press guy, but the, you know. Oh, this is, this, this meets the standards. <laughs> And they're holding the pen for me. You know, they're, give, they're handing me the pen so that I can say okay on the thing coming out of the press. And I'm not, I'm not taking the pen. Yeah, at this point, every time this machine rolls, there's like hundreds of copies. Oh yeah, they, you know, they go pretty fast. So, you know, these are times when the pressure is on me. I don't know if any of our other art directors did this stuff. They probably just stayed home, let the thing run, and they'd see it in the morning when it was all done. So I'm there, I'm looking at this thing and I said, look, I had the guy pre-separate this art at great expense and difficulty. So we didn't shoot it four color process and separate it into half tone dots. It's precisely, flat. precisely because we wanted this. To yeah, what I'm, you know, the whole thing from the day is trying to avoid what I'm looking at. I said, then we did press proofs. I said, look at our press proof. And we had the press proofs there to compare. I said, they're better than yours. This, oh, it meets the standards. It meets the standards. This is perfectly fine. I said, no, it isn't, and I don't accept it. Stop. Oh, son of a bitch. They were mad. But they stopped it. Then they walked away from me. They walked away from me. They, they abandoned me. They just let me stand there. And I got the pressman there. The pressman. And these guys are pretty technically, you know, to become a pressman, and not an apprentice, uh, you have to be good. Right. Like, like the old days, apprentice, journeyman, maestro, you know, yeah. And I said, and I'm staring at this thing, and I'm staring at it, and I'm going, why is this happening? So like Sherlock Holmes, I'm going, okay. If this turquoise is made from that, but there's a little bit of that in that, and it's affecting that, but that is not being affected, that is not being affected. However, this is being affected because what's the common denominator I'm trying to do in my mind? And I said, aha. I said, this plate that's making this color is bad. It's this plate, that's the culprit. I said, every, I said if you change that plate, everything else is gonna straighten itself out. 
And the pressman looked at me and he said, I think you're right. He said, uh, it's going to take an hour. I said, all right. Now it's 2.45 a.m., 3 o'clock a.m. I'm in an industrial park, someplace out in Farmingdale. You know, there's nothing around. There's other factories and back alleys. And I got a, I got a limo driver who's a maniac. I love him, though. He was a crazy guy. So we, we found a bar that existed only really for the employees of these factories. Right. It, it was hidden away. Didn't even have a name, I don't think. <laughs> We go in there, we just start drinking, swapping stories, crazy guy. I said, okay, let's go back. I go back, they're ready to roll, they're rolling. Perfect, perfect. I grab some press proofs, a handful, you know, roll them up, take them back in the car. And uh, that was that, that was that. So, question, were any of those wrong early prints ever saved came? were yeah. they saved no okay <laughs> we, we probably very specifically said you would, have, shit right you, there. Would, you would make a couple of hundred dollars with any of that on ebay <laughs> yeah oh now yeah right <laughs> i didn't think about those things back then i really didn't so let me follow I the original uh elder <laughs> door if i wanted sorry what was that I could have kept the original elder door if i wanted could have taken that home, you know. It was just well, laying around in the art department, falling apart. Let me do. Let me do a follow up to the story you just told me. Okay. Oh, sure. <laughs> I I have several copies of Rock and Roll Over, you know, that I collected over the years. I have a, a Chilean edition, I have a Japanese edition, and I have oh. a, an original American edition, right? Right. Which they're in Chilean <laughs> storage. I haven't. I don't have them here, but. I recently purchased one of the 2014 reissues. Okay. 2014 what? Re reissue. This is a oh, reissue. Really? 2014. Yeah. And I immediately noticed how sharp and bright the colors oh, are. Oh, oh, maybe they went back to the original. Uh, I did a art. little research about that because this is, I said, this is not 70s technology. Well, it's in there, it's in somebody's files. I guess. Now owns all that shit. Michael did it. Oh, Michael did it. Oh. He traced the original artwork on Illustrator. Oh, on a computer. On a computer. And he, ah. used, and he used Pantone colors for this. And it's so, I mean, I wish, you, you should get one of these. I mean, they're, they're cheap you know, on Amazon. I got it for like 13 bucks on, on Amazon. And the colors are incredibly bright. The, this gray here. Yeah. Is, a little bit silver and uh he did an amazing job recreating the cover on illustrator yeah yeah no he's the man so and, uh, really i mean if we had computers in the day that's the way it would have been done in the first place right. and it's uh and you can tell it's not offset it's flat colors each color is a different pantone it's really, really cool i didn't know that that's great it's really i was thinking of calling michael recently just to say hello I'm vaguely in touch with him. Every couple of years, I might say something to Michael, you know. And uh, also, there is this uh, insert. Who did this? Michael as well? Yeah, Michael, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. I love it. Me too. It will make, uh, make a great t-shirt. Oh, yeah. Great. No, yeah. It's really cool. <laughs> Would you say that Rock and Roll Over was a success in terms of uh, merch, meaning became one of the most popular images for kiss well yeah i was gonna bring i was gonna bring that up it lends itself mm -hmm. uh more than any other cover i think mm -hmm. to uh um, using it the imagery on on all kinds of merchandise right it, it, even to the point where they just take little pieces of it and use it right it's all been broken apart they'll use the the big you know saw mm -hmm. and and use, you know, use that for something. Then they'll take little pieces of the portraits and use it for something. I saw a picture of Gene the other day wearing a baseball hat. And he just had his face from Rock and Roll Over yeah, in the middle it. of the baseball hat. I never saw that before, but there it is. So they just, it can be broken apart. It so lends itself to merchandise because it's flat and bright and powerful and crisp. And there it is. It's iconic. Yeah. 
and it has become iconic. So um, did you see the, 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 the new cover he did a few years back for Kiss? He did another album cover for Kiss in, uh, I think it was 2008 or nine, I think. Did you see you that? Michael? One? Yeah. Sonic Boom? Sonic Boom. Did you see it? Yeah. What's, uh, what's your opinion of it? So, so. Yeah, I, I wasn't impressed by it. And you know mm -hmm. why? I think he had a lot more restrictions from Paul. Then, well, that's right. Uh, yeah, that's uh, very observational of you, and that would, that's my uh, that's what I say too. Uh, they had a better art director on Rock and Roll Over than they did on Sonic Boom. I didn't think much of it. I, I didn't think it was as iconic or memorable as Rock and Roll Over. First right. of all, he used pictures of the band, photographs, yeah. yes, and, and, and he yeah. kind of separated the colors as opposed to actually do. Uh, iconization versions of other faces like this. Which Drawing are, them from scratch, let's say. Yeah. I, exactly. And to me, that looked a little bit cheap. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, and Michael swears, he said, you know, I didn't just put the pictures in the computer and do something. I didn't just do that. But then he didn't elaborate what he did do. Right. So I, whether you didn't do that or not, it kind of looks like you did. It did. Yeah, it does. And I thought... And, uh, I, you know, I love Michael. I mean, I got nothing bad to say about Michael. I, I, I think a lot of that was uh, Paul. uh, Paul's <laughs> input. Yeah. 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 And everybody, look, I did how many albums for them? I don't know, 15, 14, 16, uh -huh. something. They're not all great. Uh, some are way better than others. That's going to happen. They can't all be equal. And some will be up here and some will be, some people hate Asylum and they hate I don't know, animalized, whatever. Uh, and one guy said something to me one time that made me feel better. He said, you know, Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth? Yeah, you know the Babe Ruth? baseball player. Yeah. The greatest baseball player that ever lived, maybe. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Okay. He said he didn't hit a home run every time he came up the bat. <laughs> but people remember the home, the home runs. He struck out a lot, he, you know. And I'll, I'm going to say another, another praise of all your work is the fact that you not only had to deal with um, all kinds of people walking in the office and saying, oh, I want this and I want that and just pulling you in different directions, but also you had to um, express versatility in what you do. What? Versatility. You had to be versatile, right? In order yeah. to... And diplomatic and... No, I mean, artistically versatile. You're not oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, just uh, uh, be, being able to grasp what they want in terms of style, but, yeah. also, but also just make it happen. Because from one cover to the other, you got a drawing, then another, an, an, an oil painting, and then a photograph. And they were, they were so diverse. Yeah. That one person, just one guy, wouldn't have been able to do it. You know, you needed an art director who knew who to recruit and what and how to do it, you know? Right. So I, I, uh, and I like to mix it up. I like to mix it up. No, I can tell. After I didn't work for the agency anymore and I was out of work, uh, that was 1990, the agency closed. So for five or six years, I couldn't even find a job. Oh, wow. Uh, couldn't, couldn't get hired. Uh, I tried everything. So I, I freelanced a little bit, but, uh, you know, it was rough. And uh, was that I remember because one, one guy, they were a, a, a music company. I forgot the name of the company. Was it Universal? I'm not sure if it was Universal. But they, they were doing CDs and, you know, album covers. But CDs probably at the time. And I'm showing him my work and I'm saying, you know, give me a shot. You know, let me try something. You know, he said, well, your style uh, uh, for, for was, one, was for a Christmas, Christmas uh, series. I said, no, your style uh, doesn't match uh, what we're... I said, what style? I said, you look at my work, you think I have a style? I don't have a style. I'm the doctor. You're the patient. So true. Tell me what you need. I will you know what? somehow if, do it. If I have to uh, uh, take a guess from what you're telling me, you were just another victim of uh, this... Um, stigma that 
70s and 80s rock had during the, the 80s, that everything that was related to that world, to, to that, you know, the, the 80s and, and the 70s was rejected in the 90s with, with the, 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 the grunge movement and everything was dirty. Have you seen the artwork of the 90s? Was it? Have you seen the, the cover artwork that was predominant in the 90s? Have you, have you seen what was the style that was predominant? I can't, remember. Huh? I can't remember. No one can, except for maybe one or two covers, maybe oh. the Nevermind cover by Nirvana oh. and, and uh, another one. No one remembers the covers. There's nothing really iconic back mm -hmm. then because everybody was trying to be either dirty or just, oh, let, let's, uh, let's, you know, let's spit on this piece of paper and that would be the cover. I think Metallica used a picture of sperm in one of the covers, you know? So, really good, <laughs> so I think uh, the, 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 they were deliberately trying not to be comic book or flamboyant or, or spectacular or movie-like. They were trying to, do, to go the opposite way. Just yeah. unimpressive, uh, dirty, grunchy artwork, you know? Not using the great, fabulous artists that we have out there. Um, yeah, it was, uh, I don't know, it was, it was, it was shameful. Nobody, nobody was using uh, fantasy artists anymore for album cover. Well, except the bands in Europe, because they kept doing what in America became uh, unfashionable, you know? Oh, I uh, see, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of European bands kept doing that, you know, for most of the 90s. But then the American market dominates everything, you know, so. I guess, yeah, I guess, yeah. So anyways, uh, thank you, Dennis. This was awesome. I, I think we, we, we did a lot more technical. We, 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 dig a, we dig a lot more in the technical aspect in, the, in this episode. That was great. Well, Rock and Roll Over was a technical album cover. The most technical album cover. Oh, well, yeah, you're right. So thank you so much. I'll see you in the next chapter, chapter which will be Ken again for Love Gun. Bye, everybody. Okay, bye-bye.